I was in high school still, there were two friends of mine and I used to have this competition for push-ups, how many push-ups we could do in a row. And we were competing, we were doing it back and forth, back and forth, like I'd do 100. So then my buddy would do 110, and then, then I'd have to do 120, and the other guy would do 130. So we were going, going, and going, and we were going crazy. We said, we got to stop because we're going you know, to burn out. So we, we all stopped at 204. My brother was 10. And he, we got him, we trapped him in the bedroom one day, and he started doing push-ups. He did 300. <laughs> he was 10 years old. My mother was beating on the door. You're killing him. You're going to kill him. You know, we were like, no, no, he's doing push-ups. Don't worry about it. And he did 300 as a 10-year-old. We were dazzled. This is Len. This is Len, yeah. So he's a pretty strong guy, too. <laughs> Chicago gave us Len and Ira Yupin. And in November of 2011, Philadelphia's Projects Gallery let us get a good look at their extraordinary art. Len, the push-up king, does drawings. Older brother Ira paints. I'll let Ira give you a bit of Len's backstory. I'm the older brother by seven years. I was born in Chicago and then we moved to the suburbs. My brother, I think, was three when we moved. I was 10. Because of the age difference, you know, we didn't socialize. We slept in the same bedroom. I would brutalize him <laughs> constantly. From what I understand, my brother looked up to me. I was the big brother. He ended up becoming a high school art teacher, and I was already out of Chicago. I was in the East Coast becoming an artist. So we sort of diverged at that point. We weren't together all the time. In terms of what has happened in our lives, we both had three kids. My brother, tragically, his oldest son committed suicide right around the same time that he had the stroke. But my brother had also been dealing with health issues related to this blood condition that he has, where it's sort of an autoimmune disease, where his platelet count drops. And in the original iteration of it, it was every six months, every year, he'd get a cold, he'd get something like in his skin, he could see that something was going on. He'd get these injections that would bring the levels way back up. But over the years, it's mutated. And now he's on this thing where it's, it's almost every three weeks he has to get these injections to maintain the platelet level so he doesn't bleed. So he's had a tough time. And the stroke has somewhat debilitated his cognition, so he couldn't teach anymore. And that's when he decided to start doing his, his work again. He uses an overhead projector, he takes the photographs himself, and he uses this Pentel ink pen. And depending on the image, they're looser or tighter, depending on how he's feeling, I guess. So some of them are very specific, very tight, and some of them look like it's somebody with, uh, with a tremor, just sort of doodling the lines. He's been showing over the past four or five years in Chicago now. He's getting quite popular there and a lot of requests for his work to be shown. And for both of us, I think it's sort of a therapeutic element to it. In his case, to keep himself busy, something to do, and it's evolved, in Chicago at least, in his connection with rehabilitation, other stroke patients, hospitals. There's been a lot of interest in his work based on his recovery to the extent that he has recovered. And for me, it's like psychotherapy almost. It's about how I see the world. And in this case, with these, it's me in these visions of how I see the world as sort of the main character in a play of my own design. And it just happened that we, we were both doing the same thing at the same time with, without a plan. That with Frank's push, it became a concept for the show. People seem to respond to it just because of the family connection and the similarity of, of finicky detail uh, in terms of method, even though they're different mediums. So, uh, so that's the, uh, the basic story. One of the things I really like about Ira is how his work is constantly changing. He tends to work in series, and his work is always grounded in intellectual or emotional issues. So this painting was the beginning of this series, which are essentially self-portraits. And this was for a show that was here at this gallery called Obama-Rama. I hadn't done a painting like this 
since probably the 60s in terms of small format, very detailed, and I really liked it. I needed to think of a thematic idea to, to continue with these, and uh, the strongman came to mind. All of these are, are called strongman, and then chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so forth. They're, I guess, a contemplation on what strength is in relationship to getting old and losing some of your physical faculties. I was always an athlete, very physical construction, and starting to lose that power became very uh, uh, real for me. I had some, some issues with my, with my shoulder and my bicep and surgeries and this, that, and the other. It just became not necessarily me, but the characters that I'm playing in these paintings that have to do with social commentary, political commentary, like the uh, chapter seven, the fat cat. There are a lot of people out there these days making tons and tons of money and really not caring what happens to the rest of the society. It allowed me to express any number of thoughts that I have regarding politics, social issues, emotional issues, and it seems to me in my own mind that I can just keep going with this forever. And this one's called Helpless in the Ways of the World. I think consciously I was thinking about the collapse of the economy and sort of the frustrations of what do you do? This guy's beseeching the heavens, this guy is looking at this character that's either dead or collapsed. But then later I started thinking about it, I may have had some subconscious connection to this uh, friend of mine who killed himself. He was in his 70s and he just kind of reached the end of his rope. And he was sort of helpless in the ways of the world. This was another one, Ignorance is Bliss. I forget when it was in, in 09, but there was obviously something going on between the parties, the Democrats and Republicans, while things were going down the tubes. Background of this sort of destruction scene with, with these two clowns doing acrobatics and getting nothing accomplished. Ira told me that his dad was a blue collar guy who could draw. And at a very young age, Ira tried his hand at realistic rendering. So the first time I remember, I think I was five years old, I drew a, put, a picture of my father, a pencil on a paper, it was like this big. And it looked exactly like him. Everybody was like, wow, you know, look at that. You know, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it looked like him, exactly. So, so that was sort of like this encouragement thing that you get, you know, as a kid, anything that people encourage. That's what's amazing about education. When you deal with little kids and you encourage them on something they've done, and they get that encouragement, it changes their lives. And if you keep doing that, they can become terrific at it. And instead of you put them down and, and it's all negative, then they, they respond that way. So, so this was something like, wow, you can do this. And everybody liked it. So then I was always, you know, patted on the head through school as being like, oh boy, that kid can, he can draw. You know, he can make this, make that. At this point in his life, Ira can pretty much render anything and his restless imagination has led him into the world of computers. The idea for it started with the fact that I was doing Photoshop images as, as experiments just to see what I would come up with. I don't know how to use Photoshop, but I just cranked the dials and things would happen. So how did you manipulate it? I have no idea. I mean, I just would just do stuff. As it would evolve, I would like, huh, see if I liked it or not. So these I was imagining as these 10 foot by 10 foot paintings. This was from a black and white photograph of, of a windmill in, in, in Holland somewhere. So I had about 25 or so of these images and I started thinking about painting them. But I was in the middle of this series, I didn't want to stop these to start those. So it just struck me, well, I can paint this painting in one of these paintings and get away with it and kill two birds with one stone. The idea of focusing on the art distraction of real life. This is my wife sitting on the couch. <laughs> and uh, sort of bearing it all idea of nakedness. Initially, I wasn't in fine art. I was sort of dabbling around. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And when I got down to the University of Illinois, I'd gone down there to uh, enter the uh, medical illustration program, which they had one of only seven in the country. Because of my ability to do all this detail, they thought it would be a good fit. But that bored me to death. This instructor I had, uh, Jerry Savage, said, hey, he said, you can make a living, you can teach. So 
I was like, oh, I never thought of that. I switched into the painting program and, and finished with a BFA. But then when I got to the Maryland Institute, where I did my graduate work, I didn't want to teach either. I just wanted to do this stuff and not be bothered with, with anything else. So I graduated in 73 from the Maryland Institute, had a Tiffany grant, came to Philadelphia, and I've been here ever since. So I got by because I, I married smart <laughs> after, after my grant money ran out. My wife had a, a, had a real job. It, is your wife an artist as well? Scientist. Yeah. What kind of research? Well, right now she's at the, uh, uh, the Institute for Translational Medicine at Penn. And I started doing uh, real estate development. So we bought the building we live in now, and it was super inexpensive when we moved here to Northern Liberties. And we have a rental unit in the building that paid for the mortgage and some of the utilities. So we were sort of living free in that property. And then over the course of the next 35 years, we bought more property in the neighborhood. And my plan was a perpetual income from rentals. And this one's called Safe Haven. And it's essentially a double portrait of me and my wife floating in the clouds. And then obviously she's totally decked out and I'm looking like a, like a grease monkey. In my mind, the trick, if you want to call it that, of, of painting narrative work is that you want to express a thought of your own, the way you think the thought, but you also want to leave it open enough so that the viewer can, can come up with their own storyline that maybe is close or connected in some way to what you're intending, but it possibly could be something totally different. The painting of my wife and myself, to me, was like this expression of, this is the, the, the safest place <laughs> that I've got. You know, I, my wife and, and, and me together, and we go forward the way we do, and it's like, it's, it's a sense of security. I know I can trust her, all the things that go with that. A friend of mine who's a writer in, in California, he looked at it and saw it as being like we were two separate individuals, we were far apart, he saw like a, like a darkness to it and a, and a sadness to it. He said, your paintings are like Rorschach tests, so that you can interpret them almost any way you want. I can, I can explain in this video what each one was, and it's very pat, you know, this is this one and this is that one. But somebody else may come up with a completely different interpretation of it, and that's great. I've always said that it's, I want them to have like an aura of, of story, but not necessarily like something that you can't diverge from if you feel like you, you want to, if, if you care. I mean, that's the other thing. Somebody has to care about them, and that's why I try to make them as visually intoxicating as I can, so people can't not look at them. If they like that, they, they can, like, wow, look at that, and then it's like, oh yeah, what's he talking about there? And maybe you pull them in. It's like there's a frustration maybe of wanting to be a writer or an actor by painting these paintings, particularly now the way I'm making them, where they're like sort of vignettes of a play, I get to act, I'm the character, and I'm writing a story. What, whatever they are, I'm not so sure all the time, but there's some story going on. And that kind of is very satisfying. Ira and Len's show, Two Brothers, Two Profiles, has been extended at the Projects Gallery in Philadelphia till Friday, December 23rd, 2011. These guys are grade A Chicago-reared artists whose work is gonna stick with you.